I am Hallie Kesser Jane, and welcome to the Hallie Kesser Jane Show, where, along with my partner in politics, veteran White House correspondent, and Time and Newsweek alum Matthew Cooper, we slice and dice all things politics, and some days are lawmakers too. Before we get started, the Hallie Kesser Jane Show podcast is always available at HallieKesserJane.com and wherever you most like to listen to your podcasts. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Hallie Show Quotes. Now, on this week's episode of the Hallie Kesser Jane Show podcast, have the Republicans had a come to Jesus moment on the COVID-19 vaccine? That question sets us up for a rollicking conversation on COVID-19, possible mask mandates, the January 6th commission, the indictment of Trump crony Tom Barrick, and so much more. There's a lot to get to. Let's get started. It's Hallie and Matt time. Here we go. Well, we missed you last week, Matthew. How are you? Yes, I am fine. How are you, Hallie? Um, <clears throat> hear me? Yeah, you sound a, a little under the weather. A little under the weather. Let's hope it's not COVID. I've been coughing course, and gosh. throating. I hope it isn't. So this afternoon, the doctor will tell me. Um, but let's not talk about me. Let's talk about... Yeah, keep us posted. I will. COVID, COVID, COVID. Oh, my God. This Delta variant right. is now surging. Um, do you know there were almost 10... I think there were 10,000 cases in Florida yesterday, which is, at one point, was considered the height of the pandemic for Florida. Right. One in five cases nationwide attributable to Florida. Uh, DeSantis says these vaccines are saving lives. Let's throw all of that out there and go back to the beginning. What the hell is going on, Matt? Where are we on this? This is this is crazy time. We should have learned something in the last two years, no? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, look, we've got a, uh, I'm no public health expert, but the basic contours seem pretty apparent to everyone that we've got a lot, still have a lot of unvaccinated people who, who tend to live near each other and interact. And we've got a variant of COVID that, uh, is much easier to spread uh, than, you know, COVID classic <laughs> that we experienced last year. And so that combination leads a lot of unvaccinated people at even greater risk than uh, unvaccinated people were a few months ago. So, you know, you see outbreaks in, in places where you have a lot of unvaccinated people. Missouri uh, has had real firestorm. Uh, Florida, as you said. Um, now, I mean, the good news is if you get vaccinated, uh, your chances of getting uh, this uh, variant of COVID are, are really low and your chances of getting really sick from it are even lower. So we've had a really sharp increase in cases, but the, the death rate remains a little lower, much lower, because you know a lot of people are getting it, aren't getting super sick. They don't need to be hospitalized. Uh although they're testing positive. So the the big thing here is everybody's got to get vaccinated. Uh, no more screwing around with, oh, I don't know if it works. Yeah, it works. Okay. <laughs> you know, a few hundred million people have gotten it. Uh, it. It works really well. It works better than we could have anticipated. And, uh, yeah, you got to get it. And if you don't get it, uh, your odds of getting sick are pretty, pretty damn high. And uh, it's not worth it to you. It's not worth it to people around you. Well, there are a couple of things that I want to say. Is One is it's not true that people who are getting it are less sick. Apparently, the ones who are getting it, who are the unvaccinated, and this is now becoming mostly a pandemic, <coughs> excuse me, of the unva- <coughs> as I speak, of the unvaccinated, they are younger and sicker. And there are these horrible uh, uh, tweets and, and, and videos of, of people saying, oh my gosh, I wish to hell I'd had the vaccination. Can you give it to me now as I'm dying? And they can't. And it does them no good. Um, So the thing, there's a political discussion here and then there's just, you know, the humanitarian prospects of this are just just pathetic to to watch. There was a couple on this morning who um, the family, the father and mother were vaccinated, but the kid brought the disease home. And uh, they're kind of in hard, hard shape. But yes, you're right. If you're vaccinated, you don't die. That's a good thing. Uh, you don't die. So I, I, I think we have to have that conversation on, on the political aspects of it. What's with the Republicans? Steve Scalise 
publicly getting a vaccination now and yeah well they've clearly changed their tune i mean all the uh, doctors in the house uh, along with the least the panic are supposed to do a press conference this morning or later today uh saying go get go get a inoculation mitch mcconnell said that much most of the fox news hosts are now saying that so i mean clearly something has scared uh, the crap out of them to <laughs> totally change their tune from uh you know don't tread on me individual freedom you know who knows if it works or not all that bullshit is kind of over now at least it's over mostly and it may not last so you know we'll see but it's really um well matt that it's scares really bad me that this was not it should have been marketed as the trump vaccine and like you know show your loyalty trump by you know using the vaccine from operation uh, warp speed yeah. that biden was too much of a cuck not to do I mean, they, sh- they could have sold it that way, but now they're now they're playing catch up after dissing Fauci for six months and a year and a half, and so you know, I, I hope it's not too little, too late. Well, um, you know, that brings and, up. I, I just want to yeah. c- cut in here for a second because I think it brings something up. Number one, I'm concerned over the fact that they suddenly are seeing Jesus, and I'm like going, "What do they know that we don't know?" Because this really was a you know. <clears throat> Yesterday was one thing, and today is something else. The other thing is that it was a stupid, uh, as I said, we're talking politics here. It was a stupid political uh, thing. They were killing their own. <laughs> the people who were getting, weren't getting vaccinated are Republicans, and they're the ones who are dying. I, it, it, just, it was nonsensical. I also want to say something that I discovered this week, uh, and I'm curious to what you have to... This vaccine, by the way, that... Trump so-called fast-tracked, had been in the pipeline for 20 years, 20 years. So you wasn't asking the, 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 the doctors, you know, the medical community to come up with something. They, they had it. So I would just like to bring that up because it's a, it's a little point, known point that um, people don't talk about. But, but you know, I, I think we have well, to say Well, it's that. a little, it's a, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. I mean, there had been RNA research uh, for an RNA vaccine, uh, you know, for a long time. and uh, But what they accomplished in the eight months between starting the vaccine search and the end of 2020 was, was still quite remarkable. Yes, they were not starting from scratch, scratch with right. no idea, but they were... It was still a remarkable feat, and you know I think you got to give the Trump administration some credit for that. But um, regardless, as we we're saying, you know they could have just they could have just gotten on board the Trump vaccine, but they didn't. And 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 there's also this. First of all, there's a breakout in nursing homes again, and I want to bring that up because that's an issue down here. That's you know massive. Um, right. Because <laughs> and this is the part that I don't understand. How do healthcare professionals? not get the vaccine. I mean, you know, at some point, Matt, you got to say, this world has gone buck-ass crazy. <laughs> well, no question. I mean, you've got a lot of stuff. Now, to be fair, there's a kind of, they, they didn't do the long-term testing and sort of more better work with control groups and such uh, when they introduced this. So there was some legitimate fear at the beginning, uh, even on the part of some healthcare workers. But that, you know, we're now well into this with such a huge population that's taken the vaccine that there's really there's really no reason to not take it, especially if you're a healthcare worker. Uh, and um, and you know, um, so, I mean, I, I can't, I, you know, look, New York City is going to require every healthcare worker uh, to take it in, in the uh, hospital system. Um, or they're not coming in. I, I think that makes sense. I mean, this aversion to, uh, you know, private businesses and governments being able to set standards is insane. I mean, call it a vaccine passport, call it common sense, but you can't let hyper infected people go into a nursing home without, you know, right, having, exactly, uh, having protection, having, you know, been tested <laughs> negative, or at the very least, having a lot of PPE. Um, so, so it's, it's pretty. Uh, it's I, bizarre. I think, I think. I hope we are hitting a turning point here, where the where the dead enders are gonna, you know, start to get their shots and realize, hey, you know, a lot of people I know have gotten it and they're fine. And hell, I'll get one. 
Um, I hope that's going to happen. Well, you know, uh, it brings up something else here. Um, the question then becomes, and, and I, I might have said this, forgive me if I don't remember if I said it before, I'm going to say it again anyway. It, the argument was being run by the non-vaxxers. You know, it was, we have better rights than you who choose to be vaccinated. You can choose to be vaccinated, but if we choose not to be vaccinated, that's our bigger right. The fact of the matter right. is, they're not getting vaccinated cause huge, uh, uh, kind of like, a, it's like a bowling ball, you know, you hit the one pin and they all go down. Because the fact of the matter is, right. it makes the vaccinations that we've had less potent. It it allows for the variant to spread uh, a, a faster and greater risk to all of us who have been vaccinated. So why did they get yeah. that? Why did they, why was the argument on their side when it should have been on the side of the people who did the proper thing for the greater good and for public health to get vaccinated? Which yeah, is, I, well, I think, yeah, the right. The problem is they had the president of the United States and the Republican Party basically telling that lie for. Well, that's been going yeah, on since and Biden's, well, but Biden's the president for six months and that's still getting, uh, it still has been up until this week. Uh, the case. Where are you on people being forced to wear masks, to mandate masking? I'm curious. Is it fair to well, ask I, you specifically I, or just to say, as a political conversation, where are you on that? Uh, I think you can, uh, you know, I don't know all the legalities of it. I think, certainly think, you know, masking requirements are, are uh, are constitutional. I, I think they're legal where they're enacted. Uh, I, if I was a legislator any place, I, I would enact a sensible masking requirements. You know, I don't think you need them for playing tennis, but, uh, you know, pretty much anything indoors, I think, still makes sense. So, you know, I'm for them. I don't think you can compel people. You know, I don't think you can arrest people, tie them down, and give them shots if they don't want a shot. You know, I don't think we're at that point. Um, I don't think you can legally or constitutionally, but, um, clearly but, you know. th there should be like, okay. So the kids are going back to school down here. They go back mid August. Uh, Biden last night said that he thought the children under 12 could get vaccinated soon. Uh, they will be requiring, I understand. Well, look, for public school schools kids. have had immunization requirements for a long time. Yeah, exactly. All kinds of things. There's no reason I think they can't have an immunization requirement for, uh, uh, for those 12 and up, as long as the drug's been approved for them. And look, if you don't want to abide by that, I guess you can go homeschool your kid or send them to a private academy <laughs> of non-vaccinated children and take your chances. But I, uh, I don't see any problem with these requirements or these encouragements. Uh, you know, I mean, Republicans are supposed to be all for private business, and then they're saying, like, you know, if you run a movie theater or concert hall, you can't require vaccination. Well, yeah, I think legally you can, and I think it's the right public policy to do so. Yeah, Republicans. These aren't Republicans. Can we go there? Because they're not. These are a bunch of lunatics. <laughs> I'm sorry, right. and I don't believe that they are Republicans, because Republicans don't think the way these people think um, or, or, or anything close to it, so I'm just going to put that in there. Look, at the end of the day, it comes down to this, Matt. There are two ways to stop this. You get vaccinated. You get vaccinated, right? That's that's start number one, and the second one is you lock down everything. I'm concerned that this is going to be so bad that they're going to have to do something really radical to stop it. That's what I'm thinking. Well, there's no question. I've seen lockdowns, you know, around the world um, yeah, because of this variant, and and you know, I think you're right. That's not. That's not impossible. It's um, it's absurd that it should have to get to that point when you can just get people to go get a free, inconvenient shot. I mean, it's not like this. You know, you have to pay for it. Think, <laughs> you know? Right. You think Biden it has just, been forceful enough on this, or you think he's played into the Republicans' hands? Uh, I don't know if he is the one who can persuade the uh, outstanding groups. The the uh, you know either the kind of Republican, libertarian, uh, cultural types who don't want to do it, or young people who are just like of all ideological stripes who are kind of feeling invincible and don't want to do it. 
Uh, I don't know if he's the best messenger doing it. So I'm not that down on him. No, you are. I can tell by your question. <laughs> I don't know that I'm down on him. I think the administration has somewhat kowtowed. Uh, and, and I say the administration because, uh, you know, then we're talking about the, CD, the, the head of the health and human services. And, uh, although I'm all for, and I've said from day one, Matt, uh, you may recall, go knock on people's doors and bring the vaccination to them. I mean, I was for bringing out the, uh, uh, um, you know, what's it called, the National Guard in, 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 in cities and saying go knock on people's doors and that's the best way to do this. Yeah. Um, I so don't that, know if that's the most comforting way. but Well, um, but, but when you get down to a health care crisis where more people have died from a, a, a pandemic than died in all the wars of the last uh, 100 years, I think we got a problem here. And it looks well, like... no, yeah, no question. I yeah. think the question is, you know, what's the... I mean, I like the idea of going door to door. Um, and Becerra said that. But but the point that I'm making is it's not Joe. It's somebody in his administration has to do a PR campaign that I think takes the bull by the horn and says, here's where we are, folks. Let's get real. Instead, I think they've been pandering a little bit to the to the right because they don't want to screw the right down. And, and, you know, politics is played by both sides. There comes a point, I guess, what I want to say, and then I'll shut up. Politics has to get thrown out the door, and we have to get into the reality of the situation. That's what I think. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> so, so, is there anything else we have to say on the subject of uh, COVID for the moment, or are we can? I, I think I think we covered it pretty well. All right. So we move on to oy, the January sixth commission. Wasn't yesterday fun for politics? People who follow politics. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If fun's the word, but it was. Uh... It was a sorry spectacle. Uh, Lord, give us a, 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 an overview of exactly what's going on here. Well, Congress, after a long, you know, uh, they tried to pass a law that would create a bipartisan commission. The Republicans, um, you know, it didn't it didn't pass. Um, Republicans blocked it in the Senate. Uh, so that left Nancy Pelosi to form a select committee, which is something she can do without passing off new law or new resolution. So she created a committee and had Republicans and Democrats on it. And the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, the top Republican in the House, got to name his members to the panel. I named five of them. Three of them were quasi-sane. <laughs> Two of them were, you know, a loony tones, uh, especially, well, Jim, it's hard to say especially, uh, both of them are loony tunes. Jim Jordan is the better known of the two loony tunes. The other one was uh, Banks of Indiana. Um, and, and Pelosi used her authority to, um, you know, nix those two. In other words, she kind of said, you know, McCarthy, you got to go back and get two people who don't believe, who are not potentially witnesses in this uh, inquiry, um, you know, because they were encouraging it, or um, who are just not like, you know, declaring the whole thing is a witch hunt, which this guy Banks had done. And so she went back to McCarthy and said, nah, these two are not unacceptable. you got to give me two others. And McCarthy used it as a pretext for saying, well, hell, we're not going to participate in this thing. And he had wanted an inquiry, and that's why he you know, bounced uh, uh, Liz Cheney from the House leadership because she was wants an inquiry, and indeed she is one of the Democratic appointees despite being a Republican. So right now they're in a standoff. I mean, I think you'd have to bet that it, you know Republicans won't participate in this inquiry and they'll mock it as a Democratic witch hunt. But Jesus Christ, I mean, the, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's just, you know, McCarthy could have taken this seriously to some degree. He could have been on for the original commission where he would have had much more the Republicans would have had much more power on that kind of a commission. So let's go back. Did. And so this and the, so this is where we're at. All right. Know? So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to January seventh when McCarthy blamed Trump for it. I mean, <clears throat> right? Yeah. The, okay. Well, he's clearly he's clearly just decided that uh, whatever his initial peak over having a mob attack his capital <laughs> and call for the death of the vice president, his friend Mike Pence, um, whatever. Uh, initial upset he had about that. He was willing to put it aside to kowtow to Trump and to try to become speaker next year. And so he's, you know, proving himself to be a squirrely little shit. <laughs> <laughs> and since we're on a podcast, we can say that. And um, 
I mean, you know, okay, really. well, this is, you know, this is this is where they're at. They're just going to try to not look back at January 6th. They're going to try to push forward. Uh, they don't want to talk about January 6th because they, you know, taking away their oomph going into the house races. And um, that's where we're at. We're not going to get the fulsome bipartisan investigation. I mean, look, after 9-11, you had... You know, the normal process we've had after great disasters, you had a bipartisan panel, you had serious people running it, serious people appointed to it, and they did a very, very good inquiry. I was I served on the the financial crisis inquiry commission that was created under similar circumstances, and it produced a very good um, analysis of what went wrong with the financial crisis. And, you know, we've done that throughout our our history. Harry Truman became famous for a... uh, commission he ran in congress about war profiteering in war two and you know we've done this a lot uh it was kind of a normal part of politics after a big national event but the republicans are incapable of you know participating in the democracy that way well let's go back for for a couple of seconds because the the key here is mccarthy and i want to go back to that january 7th when mccarthy said, you know, Trump was responsible for it. And then he get called to Mar-a-Lago, I believe it was, to which he went, and at which point he changed his tune. So you have to believe that the mob boss said, you know, you do it my way or, you know, the highway. Uh, and so in fear, that's where McCarthy went. Uh, here's the difference on this thing. I think they've got the goods on this commission to to pretty much finish Trump, if if they have the courage to go with it. Because I think another thing that comes into play here, and this is kind of obscure, but I'm curious as to what you think is, you know, a lot of these people are um, uh, institutionalists, and they make decisions sometimes uh, that, that go against, uh, let's say, their party affiliation, but goes to saving the institution. And Nancy Pelosi, I think, uh, can be... Um, uh, accused of this more than just about anybody, because I think that was one of her problems also with, with the, uh, uh, the two impeachments, you know. Um, but I think they have it. I think they can get Trump. And that's where the, you know, the tapes are there. Uh, and, and, and the people who participated are, are talking to the feds, you know, and trying to save their butts. So I, I think this one is on their side, even though I know a lot of people think that Pelosi yesterday, by by taking, you know, the two off the uh, commission, which allowed, you know, uh, um, McCarthy to say, we're not going to be a part of that, we're going to hold our own commission hearings, uh, which he has no authority to do. But I think that's part of the issue that's going to play here. Um, Pelosi knows what she's got. And so I think... What she 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 knew that going in, and so she was willing to sacrifice. Plus, she does have her one Republican on there, Adam Kinzinger. She, I was hoping that maybe um, he would somehow participate this, but but I'm maybe talking too soon. What do you think about what I said in terms of? Well, I think there's something to that. I mean, she clearly could have anticipated that Jim Jordan, who's uh, I believe ranking Republican on the Judiciary Committee, would have been uh, on this panel. Right, and, sure. Uh, so, I, you know, it couldn't have come as a surprise to her, so she must have had this kind of inner quiver. And, um, yeah, I think they've got a lot of the goods. I mean, that said, you know, there is still a lot to know. No one who was at the White House that day has had to testify or explain what the president was doing that afternoon. Um, you know, was he cheering? Was he shouting, hang Mike Pence? Was he saying, oh, my God, this is a catastrophe? We don't know except uh, we don't know under oath from anybody what happened, and we may never get that, but it would be good if we did. I um, think we will get it, number one. And and it's interesting, Matt, whether it, we get it in our lifetime <laughs> could become a, you know, a, a, a something to ponder. But I think eventually we will get it because the walls are closing in on Trump whether he likes it or he doesn't like it. That's the fact. And you know these people have proven themselves, I'm talking about the Republicans in Congress, have proven themselves to be complete, as you say, squirrely little shits. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to stand with him when it, doesn't, when it doesn't serve them to stand with him anymore. Well, that I agree with. I mean, 
and they'll yeah they'll jettison him exactly to, it'll to be so lives, right but I, we're we're a long way from that and I don't know how long we are so. away from that so let's let's t- let's t- let's talk about it in the, this the January sixth uh, commission in terms of other things that have um, occurred in the last week or so Tom Barrack I think this is a much bigger story than it's getting played Tom Barrack was Trump's uh, what is it? The uh, inauguration. Yeah, he's a longtime friend and colleague of Trump's from New York Real Estate, and he was the chair of the inaugural committee. And he was also Trump's go-to guy when Trump needed to put the nice face forward. Everybody, yeah, no question. Everybody loved Tom Barrett, kind of the way they liked that squirrely little shit who was the. Uh, 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 just uh, on the Nike story. What's his name? The uh, attorney? Uh, Under who? The Nike story. Uh, the, the attorney who uh, 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 handled Stormy Daniels. Avenatti? Yeah. So Tom Barrick was another Avenatti. Yeah, I don't know about that. But, yeah, but you know okay. what I'm saying? In terms of he was the nice guy. Everybody, you know, he had his moment of fame. There he was. This story about what's going down with him, I think, is huge bigger than just about anything um he's he he gets arrested and he's accused of uh you tell the story because you always do that better than i well barrack um was uh, arrested and um uh, has been indicted on several counts of violating lobbying laws and also uh misleading investigators <clears throat> on work he is said to have done on behalf of the united arab emirates to try to you know, get policies they want passed, including uh, sanctions on their uh, rival in the Gulf states, Qatar, and, um, you know, get other things they want, like weapon sales and things. Um, so, you know, there are laws that say if you're going to do that, you have to register as a lobbyist. Uh, Barrack, um, who protests his innocence, um, uh, didn't do. So uh, now we're in an interesting situation. you got a, a fairly respected guy uh, in his mid-70s. Um, you know, what does he have? He doesn't seem like a guy who wants to do time. <laughs> uh, you know, I think he'd I think he'd flip ahead of, you know, Weiselberg. You know, he, he wasn't a slavish Trump employee. He was a business guy, and his, a wealthy businessman in his own right. So, we, you know, we'll have to see where this case goes. I mean, Trump is not in a position to pardon him the way he was with uh, Roger Stone or Steve Bannon or Manafort. Well, let, let uh, me jump in here. Is... Yeah, let me jump in here because that is a point, Matt. The prosecutors had him and had this information on him before Trump was out of office, apparently. And they ha- and they sat on it and they didn't take action on it until they knew that Trump couldn't pardon him. That's part of this story. That's number one. <clears throat> <She's> like, <clears throat> <clears throat> so that's part of the story, number one. Number two is, like I said, this is a way for them to get through uh, that they could go after Trump. What was the first place that Trump visited after he was elected? The UAE. Yeah. Jared Kushner was totally involved in all of this Arab stuff. Well, sure. Absolutely. The Abraham Accords and, and whatnot. But even, even you know, uh, the, the Khashoggi yeah, thing. Yeah, there's that, no question. No this question this gets to the heart. Right, right. This is like. The Trump White House and the and the Gulf states, with the exception of Qatar. Right. So this, is, this to me, is key, is absolutely key uh, on, on one level. I mean, there are, other, there are multiple levels that they're going to be able to get at Trump. Uh, Michael Cohn this morning thinks that Jared Kushner has already flipped, by the way. I do, too, because, boy, he went silent. And they've distanced themselves out from daddy, big time. I, I'm willing to tell you that Barrick is the key to a lot of this. Uh, well, could be. <laughs> it's our you, weekly could be. It's our weekly could be. But you got you got to you got to look at this uh, in terms of um, how this is all going to play out in the long run. Because you know we tend to look at it as each each event that happens and we go uh. But I see a broad picture here, and like I said at the beginning when I brought it up, yeah. The, the I, I mean, yeah. Are closing in. Go ahead, so sure. What? Well, yeah. you know, I I tend to think um, Trump is in somewhat better shape than than you do. Um, you know, we don't know if Barrick uh, leads straight to Trump. It could. I mean, he could. I I don't. We don't know that. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of, everybody's kind of running their own scam. So, you know, Steve Bannon's, Steve Bannon's indicted. Was he convicted? I can't remember. Yes, he was point. convicted. But, yeah, he got off. Uh, yeah, convicted on running the scam on people giving to, like, you know, a build the wall foundation that was bullshit. And, you know, that doesn't seem to have had anything to do with Trump. It was just his own bullshit scam. And, you know, Barrick, uh, like taking UAE money without filling out the lobbying forms may have been his own scam that didn't necessarily mean that Trump knew about it. I mean, Trump's too out of it to really even know what a lobbying law is. So I, I, I understand what you're saying. It could be that the walls are closing in on Trump in a dramatic way. But in I a different biggest, way, I want to I want to change what you just said. In I will it, just say that the biggest thing to me is that I think, and this is just based on guesswork, so take it as you will, mm-hmm. but is that Barrick is more likely to flip than other people who have been around this. I, I, I unlike Wesselberg, who I you know, you I don't think he will. Yeah, good. I don't think he will flip Wesselberg. Wesselberg will ever flip, but I don't think Barrick wants to end his life you know, in Lewisburg, wearing a jumpsuit. <laughs> I, the thing I don't uh, get, uh, you'll have to explain some of this to me. Maybe this is a completely naive thing to say. He has so much money, Barrett. What the hell did he have to do this? What, what did, eh, half of these people were, were I, you know, Weisselberg was low, low, low hanging fruit. I mean, he was a scammer and he was, you know, that was, a, he got into the how are we going to screw the IRS kind of thing. But honest to God, yeah. a guy like Tom Barrett, who, you know, who legitimately, you know, what, what did he speak? Yeah, I mean, I don't know it why just makes you wonder. lots of fuck you money would, would uh, engage in this. I mean. I don't get it. I don't get it. I that, guess if you think, you, I, you know, I'm just speculating, but I mean, I guess if you think you're like a really important go-between between, you know, heads of state and you're really important and you want to do it secretly. You don't want everyone to know about it by filling out lobbying disclosure forms. And you think no one, either you're ignorant of the law, which is unlikely, or you think you won't get caught and you have hubris, then that explains it. But Or, you know, or half of these people don't have the kind of money that they say they have. I'd be curious to see that. Yeah, I mean, why is Weisel? I mean, why is Weiselberg going to go down over like you know a condo or, or, or a Mercedes Benz, <laughs> or like getting some tuition paid? I mean, it's <laughs> it's like ultimately it wasn't the the money wasn't enough to for this for the crime to have been committed, but apparently it was. Well, this is what I'm saying. I think these people are low hanging fruit. I think these are the guys in 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 the in the Bronx when they're like fifteen years old and going, you know, who do, let's get that little mother, you know, that that gang, that's who. I, I mean, these aren't sophisticated, you know, high end. I mean, I think that's the thing with Trump. I think Trump is basically a scallywag. I mean, he's, he, he, yeah, you know, he's he's trash. He's trash. I, and 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 everybody gives him this great sophistication because of his. He's trash. He's just. Tr- that's what he is. And everybody around him seems to be trash. You know, if you're going to do it, for God's sakes, do it with style. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's this, you know, I think the lack of tax enforcement sort of set a predicate for this. Like, if you're, there's just so many people up and down the income pole, and especially up at that higher level, who yeah. are, you know, cheating all the time. They're not really in fear of the IRS. And once you sort of, don't fear the IRS. You don't really fear, you know, not filling out a lobbying form. Who was it who made the speech that I, you, you probably saw, I tweeted about it. Who was it who made the speech or said the thing about um, the IRS and not wanting them to enforce, uh, um, uh, you know, for the for the new bills? Who was that? Who yeah, said well, the Portman had talked Port, Thank you. Right. Others. There it was. It was Portman. They were like, basically, we're not going to increase enforcement. But, so, so well, well what what are they what are the, what's wrong with these people? What's the point of the IRS? <laughs> well, it's like the inoculations thing. I mean, I think they've convinced themselves that it's like, you know, you have an individual right not to <laughs> It's just bizarre. To fly with taxes and and that, you know, anyone who tries to enforce it is a Nazi stormtrooper and so they've deluded themselves into another one of these things where they're just all of them low hanging fruit. And by the way, Portman, can I talk about him for a minute? I got a bone <laughs> with this dude. First of all, he's given way too much uh, respect. Sorry. But he's got a style to him. I'm always wary of people. Matt, listen to me. 
who go on and talk in very low voices, very convincingly. They are the biggest, loudest pieces of you-know-what. It's all style. And I, I think Portman is the lowest of the low. Just want to say, way too much credit for who he is. Okay? Did we, did we, did we, did we, did we, <laughs> you got to hear me come back with me. <laughs> I'm in a mood. I'm in a mood. Don't like this Portman guy at all. And I think that he's got way too much power. And I think they got to stop. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with well, the Democrats. Well, the door. Yeah. So, and so yeah. let him go. Goodbye and good luck. And don't let the door hit you on the way out. Good luck. Um, we, we move on. Um, except to say one other thing I, that's been on my mind all morning. Trump has been relatively quiet as all of these indictments are coming down on the people around him. So his attorney seemed to have finally silenced him to some degree. Did he say anything at all about Tom Barrick? I mean, the only thing he, I mean, he, it's in, I don't know that he's been that quiet. He's released statements. He's done rallies. He, the audio tapes of these interviews he did for various books were all coming out. Um, but that was then. That I mean, was a year ago. That, he's yeah. Quiet, yeah, well, he's quieter, but I don't think he's silent. Yeah, but but it is interesting. Let's do, you brought up the books. I do I, I do have a note to discuss them. There are these barrage of books coming out on the final days of the Trump administration. And I just want to say one thing. So what else is new? What's new here? I mean, it, it, I have to it's Well, like, there are some specifics like his wanting to <laughs> Uh, like Millie being in fear that he wanted to start a war with Iran the last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but... And all this sort of, Millie, didn't... I'm going to prevent a coup. And... See, I, I don't think any of that is surprising stuff to me. And, and all these books do is make me angry at the people who were there who for so long sat by and allowed this to happen so that we may never get this country back on its feet. Well, there's no question there's a lot of ass covering. Right. And and that's that's that to me is the story. Like I'm a little bit annoyed with now look, well, the people Barr, who read Barr was the ultimate. Well, the worst. People who review books are not political people. They're they're book reviewers who may take on the subject of political books, but they review books. I just think there's a story here, and maybe Matt and you and I ought to write the book about the people who covered up. That's the book I want to read and why they did it. Those are the interviews that I want to hear. I'm not interested in, in, in I'm not interested in, um, we're, we keep losing the internet, we keep losing the internet, I'm not sure why. I, I, um, I'm not interested in, in people uh, who have to say, you know, here's a telling of what happened. I want to know why. Who didn't and why didn't they? Want to, you want to work on it? It's a project that needs to be worked on. That's the story. That's the most important part of the story. And it's not being written. You got anything to say about that? I, I, I personally don't have the strength to go interview John Kelly and now like hear why he didn't say anything about Trump being... But, I don't, but I'm, I'm talking on a broader spectrum. I mean, you you know, I'm just no, saying... No, I understand. And, and, but I am, mean, I, yeah, am I wrong? There are lots of people like... No, clearly lots of people didn't thought he was a lunatic and did not speak up. And they, you know, they seem to have done so for, you know, charitably because they they were essential to saving the Republic and they couldn't leave and they had to stay and try to keep him from being crazier than he was. Or they just, you know, they didn't think it was really a big deal at the time. And now that they see everyone thinks it was a big deal, they're covering their ass. But, but but you do Regard, understand that regardless. if you don't get to them and you don't figure out what it was that that whole gang of people uh, chose themselves over what was best for the country, that this is just something that can happen again in a heartbeat. Well, I think a bunch of them are under the delusion that they were helping the country by staying. Uh, well. Delusion is the right. Delusion is the correct. I don't, word. I don't agree yeah. with that. I, I, but you know. Yeah. Well, like I said, that's the book that somebody needs to write. That's the book, because um, that's the only way that, at the end of the day, we're going to get out of all of this. Um, I, I want to go to Cuba very quickly, because I think this is a political hot potato for the Democrats. Uh, you know, we have a huge Cuban population down here in South Florida and across the state. Uh, you know, they're voting Republican. It's an issue. We have these uprisings in Cuba 
for the first time in a long time, and they were pretty massive, uh, and, and, and the word got out. And now the politicians uh, down here, i.e. the Rick uh, uh, Scott senator, uh, the, the Marco Rubio, and now the governor of Florida, are waxing eloquent on all of this. This, again, is an area where the Democrats are a little slow to respond and are missing their moment because they can grab these Cuban voters back. Um, you have anything on that? Well, um, yeah, I know. I, 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 am, I, I, th- I feel like Biden's basic statements in support of the protesters in Cuba and blanket statements have been on track. I'm not sure uh, the Republican line that the embargo, that we should go back to a full embargo, which is what Trump largely did. Right. Um, you know, I think the loosening of the embargo had a lot of support among uh, a lot of Cubans down there. You know, not all, but, and I think for good reason, you know, the embargo had not worked for so long. It had not had the effect of weakening the regime. And the hope was that, you know, more ties, more capitalism, more exposure right. to freedom would help. And the problem is that it didn't really move the needle <laughs> in Cuba at all. The Cubans, you know, continued to suffer. You know, the Cuban people suffered. The regime continued to be tight. And this happened when, you know, Clinton had some more overtures in the mid-90s, too. So... You know, politically, I, I don't know. What do you want the Democrats to do here? Well, I just, I don't, I just don't think that they're <laughs> siding with the Cuban voters down here enough, giving them the red meat that they that they may want. Uh, I, I, I think they they should somebody should have been down here in a heartbeat, you know, talk because there were there were you know protests and riots and whatever you want to call them and demonstrations all over South Florida, you know, after all of this happened and and uh, you know missing in action. Uh, no real statement. I'm I'm saying that you know it's Florida again. I don't know. Maybe Florida is too far south for. for well, where's uh, what's her name? The ag secretary. Uh, did she get? I, I don't. I don't. Nothing. I mean, basically nothing. And, and Deutsch and, and where were the Congo? Where was no, Schultz? No, nothing. I mean, you know, they they're just kind of there. Um, they're ineffective. You have to understand how ineffective well, they are. Remember, you know what I keep saying to you about Florida. I, the, the, it's like the Dems are throwing Florida to the Republicans, and they need to stop because it's a winnable state. I t- I totally agree. I mean, you they know. got very close to defeating. Right. Scott. So that's why and, I'm saying to you, and they and the population voted for the minimum wage increase and the felons voting. This is a place where they just don't play it right. Uh, Debbie no, Wasserman really Schultz. Bad state. I think it's a bad state party. Yeah, I think they lost. Yeah. Uh, some of their better members and. It's a mess. It's a mess. But this is a place where they could fix this mess. And and I'm just saying, that you heard it here first, because it's going to be a big deal midterms. It's going to be a big deal. So, all right, that's as much. We don't need to spend a whole lot more time on that. Um, right. uh, we're, we're back to the infrastructure bill. Jesus, what a mess this one is. Um, well, how, how does this one end? I mean, they have this crazy vote yesterday. I wasn't quite sure why Schumer did it. Maybe you can explain it to me. And he knew it was going to fail. Um, what, what, what are they? What are they? What are the Democrats doing here? They need this vote. They need to win this one. It's all over if they don't. Yeah. By the way. Yeah. Well, I think they're very conscious of the clock moving here, and they want to get more movement on this thing before we go into the fall year. Just aren't. Just given the way Congress operates, there aren't enough days left to really get things done. I think this was to to nudge the process along and see if a bipartisan deal is still workable, and and if it's not, then to try to rally all the Democrats to vote for a Democrats only bill that could pass. Um, so I, I, you know, I think we're still in the middle of the game. We're still in the middle of the chess game. Mm. Um, there's still, uh, I think, there's still a good possibility of a bipartisan bill but you know um it hasn't gotten the political momentum it really needed like you need to get through these things tend to entropy and uh you know if it sticks around too long it loses support nothing nothing really gathers support over longer periods of time so let's see how it plays out i think we're still i think there's still a lot of hands to be played but so here we are last night Biden is doing his town hall on CNN, 
and the uh, the concept of the, the story about the filibuster comes up again, and his answer was he thinks that to eliminate it would send everything into more chaos, and he doesn't think we need more chaos. Uh, yeah, about the filibuster. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, that's a fear position, in my opinion. What do you say? I think, well, I think another way to look at it is a realistic position. I mean, I think if he moves to a full, I hate the filibuster, it's time for it to go. Um, I think he's then handed himself a defeat because it's not going to go. It's not just Manchin and Sinema who want to keep it. There are others who have kind of kept their tongues right. uh, tied about it. But I don't think, uh, you know, Bennett, Warner, Tester want to get rid of it either. Well, maybe that's the story that needs to be written more, uh, not so much on, on, on uh, Manchin and, and, let, and let Tester and the rest of them take a little bit more of the heat and then see what happens. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think they're kind of thinking the best they can get is that to to make the filibuster easier to overcome, which Manchin has been open to, and presumably Cinema would be too. And her poll numbers, by the way, let me we'll throw in here. She she is not with her constituency, which is don't like her, and are saying, wait a minute, she's not voting on our best interests, and we don't agree with her. Yeah, she's definitely way to the right of her own party yeah. in Arizona. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting. And they're going to keep putting some heat on her. I mean, um, you know, their you know, administration officials are pushing the uh, infrastructure thing down in Arizona and well, let's trying go, to keep some yeah. heat on her. Yeah, keep, uh, keep heat on her. And like I said, Tester has gotten away with way too much. I just want to say he's Mr. Nice Guy, you know, the... You know, big, burly, sweet guy with the cute little, you know, crew cut. Put some pressure on people like him and on him, and let's see what, what whether that story changes or not. That's all we're going to do on this one. Let me well, move on. Well, again, I think what? it's it's tougher with the, uh, the mansion and tester. You just don't have the leverage. Well, you know, with these red state politicians who run way ahead of the president. Now, cinema, you really could. I mean, it's a well, it doesn't it's matter if you can't state. if you can't get them all, and you can only get one. It's not going to get you where you want to go anyway. So there's yeah. There's, well, let's anyway. That. I you asked me about uh, infrastructure, and I, I I think it's still playing out. <laughs> and and you think it's going to pass? But I'm more pessimist. I'm more pessimistic about it now than I was a couple of weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yeah, I, I I agree with you uh, on that, and that that would prove devastating to to Biden. Just want to say so. Um, I hope they got something up their sleeve here. Um, I, I want to move very quickly to uh, Harris because I keep bringing this up uh, with her. You know, she's in trouble, and it's really interesting to me. Um, most Americans don't think she's ready to be president, and I think that she's actually getting Sarah Palin. Women politicians, Matt, when they get into positions of power, boy, the, 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 everything strikes against them. You know. Uh, who else would say that a vice president was will was would you could could you see them doing that with Pence? They would say he's an idiot. He's a you know an ass kisser. He's all these things, but you're not going to hear he's not ready to be president. Uh, and they do that to women. So I think there's a, a female thing. There's a black thing going on with her. She's going to campaign for Gavin Newsom, who's uh, get, getting recalled. There's a recall vote for him. Uh, you got any thoughts on on uh, Harris? Well, I think she's, you know, had a somewhat inauspicious start for a lot of reasons. Um, she got handed these no-win assignments, like pass the voting rights bill and, you know, contain the border. And uh, she's not, you know, those things are not going well. It's not her fault that they're not going well, but she hasn't made them any better either. And, you know, she's she's had sort of PR stumbles, like, why haven't you been to the border? And other things. I mean, I think she's in a weaker, has a weaker political hand than she did six months ago. Um, and I do think she's, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. She is judged by a double standard. I think women politicians always are. I mean, look, uh, Amy Klobuchar got all clobbered for being that tough boss, but there are, mm -hmm. <laughs> there are a lot of son of a bitch bosses, including Biden. Um, so, you know, they get, she's got the double standard, but that's the world she lives in, and she has to deal with that. I, 
I, for the life of me, can't see why they're not doing more to expand her appeal instead of I agree. limiting it. Yeah, I'm glad that and, you said uh, that. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think she's, yeah, it makes sense for her to go to California. She was the senator. She was the senior senator. She, I mean, she wasn't senior, but she was senator. And she's, I'm sure, very popular out there still. And it's not a bad way to uh, deploy her to, you know, help ensure that Newsom remains in office. But I, I don't know if it's the staff around her who, by some reports, are yeah. all miserable, or or her own instincts are failing her, or if uh, Biden did not do enough to ensure her success. But I, I you know, I think she kind of needs to right the ship. I do too, and I think she better do it quickly. But there's nothing that she's done since January 20th that makes her in a better position to carry Wisconsin or. <laughs> Or Pennsylvania. Oh, I don't. As, I, I, or Michigan right, as yeah. as a nominee in twenty four. She could not if she were to be the nominee. Yeah, I was going to say she if she were to be the nominee, and I don't see her doing anything uh, like she needs to be doing. Uh, yeah, I, the problem. The problem. I mean, she's got a lot of time to fix this. The problem is you you don't want to feel vulnerable to a challenger in case she does have to run and Biden doesn't. Um, you know, you'd like to be able to walk to the to the nomination if you're the peep. I never thought that she was a great politician. She knew how to align herself with the right people to get her to where she needed to go, i.e. Willie Brown in California. Well, there's no question she faded quickly in the presidential race. Yeah, really so, so that's where we are on her. Well. Um, uh, but I had higher expectations for her, and... Um, you know, I hope she succeeds for the sake of the country. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, Biden's poll numbers are hanging in at about 53% compared to Trump. That's like to the moon. Um, are you happy with that number? You know, it's not bad considering we're still in a pandemic and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, you know, staying above 50 is good and, you know, it could be better. But I, I think he's had a pretty appealing demeanor uh i mean i sort of think in a way his being older and slower is helping him because he's less of a threat you know a motor mouth yeah he's he's kind of less of a just he seems like a more serious guy because he speaks more slowly and cautious i actually think the he's clearly aging i mean i think i think his critics are right about that i mean i don't think he's you know demented but he's clearly getting older and but I think the more halting Biden is sort of more appealing than the loquacious Biden. Listen, I think he's aw shucks and, uh, you know, FDR kind of, you know, big daddy. And uh, he's non-threatening and he's very available to the public, like just doing that CNN thing last night. Even if he fumpered his way through it, which he did, and he doesn't stay on topic, and he does, he never did, by the way. That wasn't anything new. But I think that he's the right man for the right moment at the right time, and yay. Uh, um, uh, you know. Yeah, I don't think the Biden 20 years ago would have projected as well. Oh, God, and which is why he didn't become president 20 years ago. So, yeah. so there you go. I want to bring up inflation very quickly because it's a nightmare. And uh, I don't know how long Biden's it'll correct itself conversation continues uh, as people struggle to buy gas and pay for food that's out of the world, out of this world pricing. So I just, I wanted to throw that in because I think that's another issue. Keep your eye on it because if it doesn't correct itself soon and it's, things are going to get, it may correct itself because I think if this COVID thing becomes what it looks like it's going to become, I think people go back to their houses and so um, there's going to be a little bit of that crazy. Uh, in fact, unemployment was up this week unexpectedly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, look, there's no question, uh, you know, we, we have an inflation spike going on. I, I still think, you know, as the Fed and the White House do, uh, that this is more likely, you know, a temporary as the economy kind of settles back to normal. Um, you know, but, but there's no question people are feeling it and women are feeling it because uh, they do so much of the household shopping and, and bill paying. And so, you know, they're, they're kind of the canary in the coal mine for it. And, you know, look, it's an issue. Uh, let's, you know, but let's... Uh, well, you know, it's, it's an uh, issue. For the let's, Democrats' sake, yeah. they better hope it's, you know, it's one that wraps itself up in a few months, not, you know, a year and a half. Exactly, because it's, it's a little crazy. Can we talk about Ben and Jerry in a minute, for a minute? Uh, the, oh, it was a crazy week for anti-Semitism. Uh, 
to to say the least. Well, I don't know if ben, I don't know if Ben Cohen is anti-Semitic. I, I think he's. A, I think I, he, I think that that was a very very ugly move. Let's say what they did was they refused to sell their ice cream in what they call the occupied ter- territories. Um, you know, the land that uh, the Israelis won in the war, uh, the West Bank. So uh, the last thing you need is a Jew, and particularly at this time when things are so crazy, Matt, and anti-Semitism is so on the rise, and this wacko from director of Human Rights Watch himself posts this anti-Semitic crap, which the tweet came down. I don't know if you know that. Um, so President Biden's going to nominate a State Department ambassador at large to combat and monitor anti-Semitism. Well, you've conflated a few things there. I, okay, I, I'll, I just think, threw it all out. It's all up to you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think being concerned about sales in what the U.S. and what you know the world regards as occupied territories, and many Israelis do, and that are not been annexed, they're not part of Israel. Um, you can call them what you want, but they're not. Uh, they're not formally annexed the way East Jerusalem is. You know, look, I think you can question the. I think you can question the wisdom of the decision. I don't think it's BDS. I don't think it's anti-Semitic. I don't think it's anti-Zionist. What is you know, it? I don't know what I it's would. It's political. Well, there's no question. Of well, political. so if there's it's no political, question. it goes it's, under. It's, it, no question. It is a statement against um, is Israeli control of of. Uh, the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, whatever you want to call it. There's no question that it is political. Uh, well, my argument is we don't need this kind of stuff because it gets conflated with anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli, and it goes, it, it just it it, it it doesn't serve anything for Jews themselves to be doing that kind of stuff. It just doesn't. Not when it's so scary. And down, well, I just, just don't know scary. if you can speak for all Jews on that. I mean, I you know you can disagree with the J Street crowd and others who were supportive of this decision. Oh. You know, I understand where you're coming from. No, I know but, you do. I mean, I know you do. I just I'm throwing it yeah, out there. Yeah, but a lot of Jews are a lot of Jews are in a different place on that, and uh, it doesn't I, make I, a lot of Jews were in a different place on Hitler too. Oh, uh, come on, come on. Come no, no, on. no. That's not a good. No, no, that's a fair analogy. Let me tell you why that's a fair analogy. That's a fair analogy because there were a lot of Jews in Germany who said, ah, not such a big deal. Uh, you know, this is all talk. It's all but it, until they were all dead. So it is a fair analogy. Sorry. Well, look, a decision not to sell chunky monkey in Ramallah or well I think Jericho that's no I'm sorry I think that that that's not what it is the same no. and is the same as being naive about Hitler is, mm-hmm. is no I don't agree I think an so we're not going to agree but Good, if, you, I think like, the, if yeah. you think they're the same I don't think I can convince you otherwise <laughs> you can't convince me otherwise I, I think it I think uh, it's a look, rolling uh but uh, look political on, on, point on, of view I, that's I do agree dangerous. with you about uh, about uh, Ken Watts of the Human Rights Watch. But that's who, just b- bizarre. You know, had a sort of like the Jews brought it on themselves uh tweet the other day which he defended um and then walked away from. And then yeah, and then so. two days later, uh, um you know, Ben Cohen did this crazy thing with whatever and I'm just simply saying the timing is weird, the the, the what it's all about. Well, I, I agree. The timing the timing is not good. I just don't think the motivation on the part of Ben and Jerry's was anti Semitic. I think it was anti you know, anti Israeli control of the West Bank. I mean that's but, so I'm going to do look. a rare thing. I'm going to let Matt get the last word on that. We'll we'll be revisiting that, I'm sure. Let, let's uh, the Olympics are going not so great. I do want to talk two things: Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates Roadshow, and what happened to Matt Gates's July indictment. Right, we've talked about that before. I don't know. Don't know why it's not going yeah. through. It yeah, seemed like he had plenty of evidence. Maybe they're still gathering. I uh, don't know. And and he's out there raising money and doing all sorts of crazy things. Pillow talk. Cute thing last night, President Biden revealed that he doesn't allow the Secret Service detail in to the uh, residence until after he has his breakfast because he likes to eat his breakfast in his PJs. He's a mensch. Oh, <laughs> oh well, that's nice. And isn't he a mensch? That's, yeah, that's, that's nice. the thing. He's a mensch. There's a lot more to get to. We don't have time, folks. Uh, anything you want to say as we close, Matthew? Hallie, I, I want you to get to the doctor because you're not feeling well, <laughs> oh, and I want you to let your loyal listeners know that you're okay when you get that report. I will do that, darling. I will speak All to right. you 
shortly. And talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Helicaster Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. The Helicaster Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is available at HowlyCasterJane.com and on all your favorite apps. Be sure to visit us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and follow me on Twitter at The Halle CJ Show. Until next time, this is Helicaster Jane.